Today, we are talking about navigating through life's uncertainty. With Jesus as our hope, our anchor, and the only certainty in our life, how do we do that? You know, recent times especially, uncertainty is the state of the world. Many of our lives are continually being disrupted. Having, you know, some of your holidays, your work trips are being cancelled. And having BCPs and WF. H, work from homes and teleconferencing and all these things, you know, just kind of like a, it's a new norm right now. March holidays is next week and some of you are having a headache because you're going to, sit, you're going to be at home with your kids 24-7. Some of you are going to go nuts like that. And so what to do now? Many businesses are taking a hit from COVID. Things are getting more and more uncertain. The world is sitting on its edge because we are unsure of how, how long this will last. When will we end? or it will go on even longer, or how. So that's why today, it is a privilege to have Mr. Lucas Chow with us, because Luke, Lucas here is, besides having lots of experience in very various well-known companies, and also he knows uncertainty quite a fair bit in his life, but he also is a very committed follower of Jesus. So church, can you help me, wherever you're watching with me together, put your hands together to welcome Mr. Lucas Chow. The 2008 global financial crisis was considered by many to be the worst crisis since the Great Depression in the 1930s. While businesses were retrenching workers to stay afloat, one man led Mediacorp to survive the crisis without cutting its workforce. Let's welcome Lucas Chow, former CEO of Mediacorp, Singtel and Far East Orchard and chairman of Health Promotion Board and hear how he navigated through life's uncertainties and how his faith changed the way he sees work wealth and life itself. Good morning, Lucas. Good morning. Good to have you and with us. It's a pleasure. No Thank church, you. let's give him a big hand again. Welcome him into this place. Thank thanks. you very much for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here with us. You know, let's start off with some light-hearted questions. I mean, we all know of the various things that you do and the positions that you hold. But what about you personally? Like, what are some, you know, the hobbies you might have, interesting experiences you might have in life, and you can just share with us. Sure. Um, I call myself an old man, but with the curiosity of a young boy. Um, oh. My late mother, uh, she used to tell me that uh, all the toys she bought for me, uh, instead of playing with it, I will basically dismantle it and, uh, and, and find out what's inside. So I'm always very curious about how things work. And I'm quite a foodie. Uh, for those of you who know me, I enjoy uh, food very much. Um, Many of us do as well. Yeah. So uh, there was one stage I was very interested um, in coffee. So when I'm interested in something, I wanted to find out more about it. So I spent a lot of time, energy and all that to find out about coffee beans, where do you grow coffee beans, you know, the arabica, you know, the, and, and so on and so forth. And how do you roast them and how do you brew them? Wow. So I even bought... Um, quite a few of those coffee making machines, whether they are automatics or from, from fully automatics to fully manual, and I even bought the smallest espresso pot. How small is it? It was, it was actually for one cup, and you can actually carry it for camping or the travel wow. and things like that. So that, that, that's me, that's why I'm curious to find out. But the problem with me is that I also lose interest quite easily. So I lost interest in them, and, and most of them are, of course, you know, not used anymore. And at the end of the day, I found that this automatic machine in the morning, you just press the button and then, you know, espresso comes out and that's the best. Exactly. <laughs> and, um, and then in my, uh, in my uh, retirement, mm -hmm. all right, um, I venture around Singapore to find out what are the best hawker food that we have. Wow. Um, so you can imagine that because when I was working, it's hard for me to go and eat hawker food because, you know, hawker centers normally are not air conditioned and I'm expecting to wear suit and tie when I go to work. It's very difficult to wear suit and tie to have hawker food no without taking a shower. So, um, so now it's like I'm back in the vengeance, you know, I go around Singapore and find all so kinds of So do you compile like a list? Uh, I, should, I should do that, actually. All right. Somebody has suggested to me, all but right. maybe when I publish it, so I'll you can share you know. with us. And we Absolutely. can post it online for those of us who are watching online. Absolutely. Okay, but this is not the biggest takeaway for your son, our <laughs> sharing here, right? <laughs> okay. So watch that space. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you have such a storied career, you know, in many senior positions in different companies, you know. Maybe you can just walk us through the journey that you had and how was it like? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm really blessed, actually, uh, to be given so many opportunities um, in my career. 
Um, as you can see that, you know, I have been to uh, many industry and I held senior position in some of these companies. Um, and I'm not, I don't think that I'm smarter than any one of you here or am I well connected, you know, being born in Hong Kong and come to Singapore um, uh, in 1978 as a foreigner, I don't have the natural network uh, that many of you have. Um, and I, 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 don't really, I don't really work harder than any one of you. So I really think that it is really God's grace that given me all these opportunities. So many of you know that I, I was the CEO or chairman for organizations and all that, but many of you would not know that I actually started as a delivery boy when I was in Hong Kong. I got my diploma from the Hong Kong Polytechnic, um, and then I went to do my degree in, in England. Um, and then I came to Singapore, uh, 1978, the National Day of 1978, uh, from England after I studied. And I started working in Hiller Packard, uh, Singapore, as an engineer. I, was, uh, I had a very good career with Hiller Packard. Um, I uh, was among the first few expatriates uh, to, to be sent from Singapore to the headquarters. And, um, you know, I still remember I, I have a reserve parking lot, you know, just outside my office while everybody is parking in a huge parking lot, right? It's almost like a soccer field. I worked in Hiller Packard for 20 years, and then I moved on to Singtel, to Mediacorp, and to Far East uh, before my retirement. And then in my retirement uh, career... Which is uh, right now. Which is right now, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, you see, a lot of people think that, you know, retirement, it's, uh, it's like just you know, have a lot of time in your hand, go fishing, go golfing, and things like that. But I'm going to tell you, it's quite different. Don't send the retirees to queue up for movie tickets or bagua during Chinese New Year. You know, because, you see, for retirees, for people like myself, right, uh, we have not much time. So, so time is very, very precious to us. So, so we, we don't want to waste our time, okay? So time is very precious. So I'm always in a hurry. But in my retirement, uh, I've been involved in the marketplace ministry, uh, so I initiated the Sort and Light uh, portal. Uh, right now, it's actually under a company called Thirst Collective. Uh, it's a non-profit company, and under the company, we also have uh, Thirst, T-H-I-R.S-T as well. And we are in the process of setting up a Chinese portal. Uh, so, and also, uh, in my spare time, I'm helping out with uh, Sort Media, which is a cinema and entertainment company, and we have a cinema uh, in Capital Tower. Wow. Not many people would know that actually you are the one, the whole sword and light is your brainchild and you know, you created it. And especially in recent times, it has been so helpful, especially during the COVID season where this is where we get the source of positive news among all the negative news, right? So really thank God for your, your calling during this whole retirement time to, to, to do this and to champion this. We, yeah. we thank God for that. And of course, when we started, we do not know that it is for a purpose for such a time like this. Yeah, so it's so great. You know, today we are talking about navigating through life's uncertainty. And you know, with the whole situation of COVID-19 in Singapore, and we do not know exactly how things are going to be. And in our conversation, uh, previously, you are very familiar with uncertainties in your life. So how do you make sense of uncertainties and the situation in your life? How do you navigate through what some you know, wisdom and advices that you can give all of us here? Um, sure, let me, let me first start with um, uh, talking about uncertainty is certain. Uh, if I may just bring out the first uh, PowerPoint slides here. Uncertainty is certain. Our history has been telling us that the world is full of uncertainty, you know. Uh, we can't really predict what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, when I was preparing for this, uh, this uh, sharing and this interview, uh, the price war, the, the price war in the crude oil uh, just, just started. And within a single day, crude oil actually dropped by 25%. And of course, recent days has recovered somewhat, but it is still one of the lowest, you know, since 1991. And then, just as we thought that you know, we have the COVID-19 and, uh, and all that, and you heard that uh, the, the, the Wall Street, you know, the, bull, the bull run literally ended 11 years of bull run. And we are in one of the worst time, even worse than the global financial crisis. The COVID-19 as an example, is a disease that many people, when, we, when it first started, many people, many countries, thought that it is so far away. It's not going to affect me because it is something so distant. But look at it today. It practically turned the world upside down. 
So if, I, if you allow me that I would like to quote uh, some Bible verses uh, from the book of James, book, uh, chapter 4, James chapter 4, verse 14 to 15. You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. I was heading a printer division um, in Hewlett Packard, Singapore. We were responsible for the design, manufacturing, and marketing of the printer. It's an entry-level printer. Nevertheless, we have big dreams for this little uh, printer. So my engineers, was, they, they were very, very clever. They were very brilliant. They, come out, they came up with a printing solution called, called the Mosaic Printing. So you, you can imagine that if you have a picture, if I divide the picture into like mosaic tiles, and I print each of these tiles on an A4 size printer, and thereafter I put it back together like mosaic, I have a brilliant poster and even wallpaper. Just as we thought that, well, we deserve more bonus and more recognition, I was asked by the company to transfer the division and the product to somewhere else. I was asked to dissolve the division and find jobs for everybody. So me and my team at that point in time were scratching our heads and trying to process what, what is happening to us. Uh, but the consolation we took away was um, our experience in developing the printer and working together, there's something that will stay with our brain and it cannot be removed. Just as the saying goes, one door closed, the other door open. I think it is not, if it is not because of that, most probably I would have retired in Hiller Packet and I would not be working in Singtel and Media Corp. I want to share with all, every one of you here, change is the only constant. Change is the only constant. Sometimes we needed that push in order to change. And sometimes it's the change that we desire to catapult us forward. Whatever it is, my conclusion is change is the only constant. And we find ourselves changing every day. My body is telling me that I'm changing every day. I cannot be running faster than you. And, uh, you know, and I cannot do a lot of things when I was younger. After the, again, if I may use the COVID-19 situation as an example. Um, look at you right now. You have changed. Your social distancing is making you, you know, making the church worship service change. You, you wash hands, um, you know, more frequently. And in fact, um, I was, uh, some people share with me a very funny video of Prince Charles. Uh, some of you may have seen it on the internet. Uh, he stepped out from his car as usual, and he, and he reached out his hand and tried to shake hands. Then suddenly he withdraw, you know. It was so funny that he withdraw. Then he said, oh yeah, yeah, we're not supposed to shake hands. Then he walked to the other person, he reached out his hand again, and the other person just basically keep the hands to himself. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, you know. So you see, just, just because of something like that, many, many things um, has changed. Before this thing started, I already uh, have some of these things like washing my hands, we, we, when we eat together, we use serving spoons, and so on and so, on, so forth. Not, not because I'm smarter than any one of you, but because you know, I went through the SARS spirit, and the SARS spirit also taught me a lot of lessons. I have changed since then. I know that uh, many companies right now is most probably uh, scrambling to, to, to implement uh, BCPs, uh, uh, business continuity plans, and so on and so forth. But still, no one can predict what is going to happen, what is going to happen next. So un uncertainty, therefore, is certain. So what shall we do then? Shall we then do nothing? My advice to you is that don't be a boy frog. The boy frog is talking about, you know, if you put a live frog in, uh, in, in water and you increase the temperature very, very slowly, you, the, the frog basically will be buoyed alive. It is a metaphor to caution us to be aware of the even smallest change, the gradual changes around us and pay attention to those kind of changes. Even though life is full of uncertainty, change is the only constant. And you want to prepare, be, uh, prepare for it 
and you want to even take advantage of the change, of the situation. But first and foremost, you need to pay attention to what's happening around us. I want to say that, so what are we going to do in response to changes, in response to uncertainty? I think you have to do, you have to make sure that you change in response to changes. Again, case in point, we talk about COVID-19. Interestingly is that a lot of people do not want money because we always say that, oh, money is dirty, right? Literally, pun intended. But nowadays, you, you give people money, money that people say, no, 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 no. Direct transfer, pay la, you know, pay wave, whatever, pay, whatever form of not touching the money because they know money has been transacted many times. It was so funny that when I saw one of the uh, social media video clip that some, some people wanted to uh, sanitize the money, so they put the money in the microwave to end it up that, uh, of course, <laughs> you know, our money cannot be microwave. So it, it's ended at, at a loss. And people want to stay away um, from crowded places and so on and so forth. Just as we saw that many of the cinemas, uh, you know, even uh, uh, blockbusters and all that are being uh, deferred, the, the premiere has been deferred, um, you know, travel has been delayed, um, the uh, hospitality industry, the, the, the other industry has been affected. We are talking about tens of millions of people are being affected. But that in itself, it doesn't mean that everything goes down because then you suddenly saw an online uh, shopping, you know, some of the people normally, they, don't, they do not want to shop uh, online, and you will see that the online uh, shopping has actually grown in terms of volume. Uh, online streaming, because although they cannot go to the cinema, but they still need to be entertained, right? So you see that the, on the online uh, streaming platform has been uh, doing very, very good business during this period of time. The Chinese word of crisis, uh, we call it wei qi, when there is danger, there are also opportunities. The question is whether you are prepared to capitalize on it. I'll give you an example. Even because of COVID-19, even very traditional churches right now has changed. They provide online streaming just like Hope Church uh, is doing right now. And some of them actually reported that their, their self groups and their life groups uh, have more gatherings and more people are attending those, uh, those uh, gatherings and they have actually seen more people attending their church services including those uh, attending online. In commercial terms, we call this underriched or underserved market segments. So in times like this, we have to ask ourselves, are there any market segments that are underserved and underriched? I also want to share a little bit about preparedness at peacetime. So we have to practice um, at peacetime. How are we going to prepare ourselves at, at peacetime? In my humble opinion, the best time to get ourselves ready for crisis is at peacetime. Many people look at Singapore the way that we respond to this COVID-19 situation and say that, wow, you know, we are gold standard and, and our hospitals are doing, uh, handling it very well and all that. If I may quote some of our ministers during a recent interview, he said that it is not by chance. It, it was a long preparation to, be, to prepare our healthcare system, our healthcare professionals. We talk about ventilators. I mean, because COVID-19, some of the patients will require ventilators. And ventilators, you cannot just go out there and get it when you need it. We have sufficient to handle the situation in Singapore is because we were prepared. I used to do something of what I call scenario play. Some of my colleagues may remember this. I used to have a war room very close to my office. So in that war room, we gather information about com competition, about the environment that we are operating in, internal as well as in, uh, external uh, environment. Internal environment can be, be, be due to uh, turnover rates or whatever. So we put all this information in the war room and we look at them and we play out various scenarios. What if that this happened? What shall we do? But of course, you know, um, it, it is hardly uh, any chance for us to hit this thing on the bull's eyes and say that whatever scenario play, it, it came out exactly as it is. Very rare, very rare. 
But that goes to show that, but that, that's helpful because when you do the scenario play, certain elements of the scenario play may come out. And that could be very, very helpful when that comes out. So at least, you know, you are uh, prepared. You are better prepared than, than you are not. We know that um, even with our government, we, we run rehearsals, we run drills. Uh, those are very important to get yourself and your organization uh, ready uh, for such a situation and to identify some of the potential issues um, that you can, you can iron out during peacetime. And last but not least, I think most, important, most importantly, we have to remain to be flexible and we have to adjust to changes. So the, uh, the reason why our church is able to also kind of like a do this size down and do pop-up services in the various uh, live groups right? is because before this, we, are, we have been doing pop-up services, blackout services, and everyone's very much prepared for this as well. So it's really quite true, you know. And I, I'm hearing a few things. Change in response to change. Don't be a boy from. Get prepared for things. And I'm hearing as well in terms of getting ready during peacetime. You know, think of the various scenarios. So these are really good. And I want to understand more as well in what difference does your faith makes? You know, your relationship with God and your understanding of God. You know, how, does, how do you navigate through life uncertainties with God and His values in your life? What some experiences you can share with us? Sure. Um, I, I wasn't a Christian, uh, you know, when I was, I, I, my family, you know, I was born into a family that, you know, ancestral worship and things like that. So I wasn't a Christian until much later part of, of my life. And when I grow up, um, the advice I always hear is man up, man up. Man up. Because I'm the, I'm the eldest boy in the family, you know. Um, so being the eldest boy, you know, you're expecting to, you know, kind of, carry the family flag and, and so on and so forth. So whenever it comes to uh, problems like that, you know, you man up. I still remember um, that before I, uh, before I come to know God, uh, the way to deal with uncertainties and adversity is basically bite my lips and somehow or other find strength to continue um, and, and overcome and just, just carry on. And that's what many people are doing now. Just go through it. Right. We will overcome this. You know. That's right. Um, but then, ever since I be, uh, become a, became a Christian and come to know Jesus, um, I, I can slowly trust in God with my problems. And I develop a habit of praying and speaking to Him about my problems. So building trust and, and um, uh, relying on God, to me, is a process. It's a process that um, it started with something very, very small and then eventually everything. Mm. If I may, I would just want to share a very quick example. I still remember I was a young Christian at that point in time and I was supposed to make a presentation in a multinational company. And um, presentation is very important. Some of you will know that. You know, it actually make and break uh, in your career in, in, a, in some companies, right? So I used to prepare very, very well. You know, I drill, I practice, blah, blah, blah. But I was quite cheeky. Since I, be, I was a young Christian, I said that since people tell me that I can rely on God. So I finished preparing all my presentation. I, instead of practice, I just laid it on the table and I said that, God, if you're so good, you're going to guide me through and I go to sleep. So I was tired. Well, I, this is a very bad example. We're not supposed to test God, <laughs> of course. <laughs> that, but to my surprise, you know, the next day when I went through the presentation, many people were asking me, who's your coach? You look as you're using... Um, examples and using terminologies that, that we, you know, I, we, we never heard you speak about. So in my heart, I was too shy to say that. Exactly, it wasn't me. It was somehow God. Um, I, I was too shy to share at that point in time that, uh, that, that there was God that there was uh, guiding me through. So every time when I find myself in situation of uncertainties um, and, and so on and so forth, uh, I, I had developed uh, a habit of going to God in prayer and asking for um, uh, advice and wisdom. Now, you see, when you move uh, in certain position, and sometimes our problems cannot be openly shared. And I just want to share with you one particular example. During the last global financial crisis, I was the CEO for MediaCorp. And you know that at that point in time, many companies were badly affected. Retrenchment was a very common practice. 
So one day, my CFO came to see me and said that, Lucas, we have to retrench 10% of our people. If not, we will not stay afloat in the black. So it really, it really burdens me. Because if I actually you know, activate the retrenchment, which is a very common thing to do at that point in time, a lot of my staff, they may not be able to find another job elsewhere because all their skill sets are only suitable for the media industry. They have no experience outside. And besides, the people, else, the, people uh, the industry, the company outside are not, really, are not really hiring. So I asked myself, how can I act as a leader? How can I act with humility? How can I act justly? How can I act with compassion? So I was at my wit's end, and I remember at that point in time, you know, I, I really committed a lot of my time praying and seeking for wisdom. Then the idea of the Media Corp Day Off was born. The idea was simple. I mean, everybody, make everybody work 10% less and take home 10% less. Of course, the idea was simple, but the implementation was not. But with God's grace, we were able to survive the global financial crisis uh, without any retrenchment. Wow, that's amazing during that time. Hmm. Thank you. How, how was it challenging that time when you say that imp the implementation was challenging, it was tough? Because, you see, the common wisdom at that point in time, even th some of the board members uh, was, was questioning, why am I not retrenching? Just retrench, right? Just that's retrench, because that's the easy, there's a clean cut, you know, and, and uh, many, of, many of the company also took that opportunity to right-size themselves because they may be carrying a lot of the load. So, um, and of course you can imagine, right? It, it, Mediacorp, was, it, it's a company that we provide uh, free-to-air television, radio, newspaper, you know, etc. You cannot have a blackout screen, screen on television, especially during such a time, uh, you know, uh, like that. The radio station has to go on. We still need to do, do news coverage. So we are basically asking everybody to, to do 100% of their work in 90% of the time. Wow. So it, it, was, it was very challenging. I still remember the, the first week when we did that, uh, the canteen was closed, but some of the staff have to go on because the news has to go on, the broadcast has to go out and all that. And I was back in the office, right? So the people come to my office and say that, boss, the canteen is closed, we have no food. So we, we drove to the famous Farrer Road Hawker Center and uh, packed the food back for our colleagues. Nasi so, Lama. So, Lama, yeah, and that kind of thing. So, Food I mean, I know, yeah. yeah, I mean, that, 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 that goes to show that while the idea was simple, but the implementation to getting the support, getting the logistic going and all that, it took a bit of uh, um, uh, fine tuning. But what motivated you? Why didn't you just, like, you know, just return, you know? What kept, what kept, what, why you have the heart to really want to keep everyone together? And what were some effects that you saw, you know, after that as well? Ever since I became a Christian, um, I model after Jesus, the model of um, servanthood leadership. You are the leader. You are like a shepherd to the frog. My job as a leader is not only to provide return for shareholders and, and, and so on and so forth. My job is also to look after my frog, my people. And these are my friends, these are my colleagues. So it, will, it is Every time when you need to make a decision of letting somebody go, it's a very difficult one for me because they are my family. They are my friends. You see them every day. How, I, how am I going to tell them that, I'm sorry, you, you, know, you are one of the 10% and you have to, uh, have to go? And besides, I think during that time, many of them actually have informed me that they have family members had already been retrenched. And some of them are so breadwinner for the family. So the burden um, is really on me. So I, I want to just maybe share with all of you, some of you really desire to be you know, the CEO or the bosses or whatever it is. The bigger the job you have, the more responsibility that you are gonna have on your shoulder. And, and you, you can only be a good leader if you really, truly, truly care about the people that are under you. That's so good. You know. Let's give Lucas a big hand again. Thank you. You know, one, one big area of uncertainty in many of our lives is in this place called the marketplace. Right. And sometimes we do, there are lots of unknowns and 
lots of hopes and disappointments as well. So from your own experience, how can we navigate this area of uncertainty in the marketplace even better? What advice would you give us? You know, um, the thing is this, that how do you make decisions, right? Uh, because decision, decision, decisions. Not only the, the senior management making decisions, we make decisions every, every day. We make decisions as to what are we going to have for lunch, what are we going to have for dinner, where do we go for holiday, you know? We, we make decisions all the time. Whether you are a Christian or you are a pre-believer, you make decisions all the time. So the question is that, how do you make such decisions, all right? Now, I want to share a little bit uh, of uh, myself here, if you, if you don't mind. Um, I just finished my, uh, I, I just received my O-levels results. So I wasn't a Christian at that point in time, and I do not know whether I should go to do engineering or should I go to medicine, right? So they're two very different tracks. Um, and then my teacher was asking me, my school was asking me this question. So I took out a coin, a, a coin in my pocket, I flip head or tail. You know, and then I ended up doing um, engineering. No way, really. You flip it. I flip it. I, I flip it. Engineering. You go. So in front of my teacher, my teacher also didn't stop me. Uh, <laughs> maybe my teacher sh should be wiser, but my teacher didn't. Have, I, she didn't stop me. So she saw me took out a, a, a coin from my pocket. I flip it and pop. You know, so engineer. Wow. But actually, I don't think I should be engineer. I don't think I should be a doctor because that is really not my area of interest. But that's basically, uh, uh, you know, decided you know. my career, and I became an engineer, and the rest are history, that's what they say. But again, then what is the difference between now that I, uh, I became a Christian, right? Um, so how do you decide, how do you make decisions, you know? Um, I remember at that point in time, uh, I, was with, uh, I was with Singtel, I was with Singtel, some of my colleagues are, are, are here. Um, you know, I was with Singtel and I was doing, you know, very good because, uh, you know, the business is, is doing well. Uh, you know, we, we, we have very good relationship with everybody, you know, the colleagues and then my bosses and so on and so on. I, I, was, I was just having a great time. And then um, we just celebrate, we were just celebrating a turnaround of our business. You know, it was a very challenging time for that year. But, you know, the team actually managed to turn around. And we were in, in Malacca, in the Equatorial Hotel, celebrating and so on and so forth. I have a phone call, and some of you nodding your head because you remember. We, we, I, I received a phone call. And uh, there was some executive search firm and say that, Lucas, you know, we want you to go to MediaCorp and uh, be the CEO. And I remember laughing, ha, 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 it's a joke. That was before they throw me into the pool. But then, I've get, you know, credit to the, to the search firm, they keep on calling me, keep on calling me, keep on calling me. And at that point in time, I, thought, I, I pray about it, and, I, and, the, and this time I didn't flip a coin. This time I, <laughs> I went to see my pastors. And, and you know, the pastors will always tell you that pray about it, pray about it, pray about it, right? So, so of course, my, my pastor is also my confidant, and uh, he said, go pray about it. I said, I did, I did, I pray already, so how? Flip then, coin. Then he, he came back and said, okay, let's pray together and all that. Then after praying, um, he gave me this, this sentence. He said that, look, media is a very important uh, industrial segment. Uh, the CEO will control, you know, what's, what are the contents going out and so on and so forth. Isn't it better to have you, a Christian, at the head than somebody else? But after that, he said that you still go home and pray about it. <laughs> Fine. So, so the, the change, the, the difference was I, I eventually, you know, um, agree that, okay, um, I will do it because moving from Singtel to Mediacorp was a sacrifice, both in terms of financial and in terms of other things as well. So, so I have to, it was, a, it was some sacrifices that I have to take. But I didn't realize at that point in time, perhaps the reason of going to Mediacorp was for such a time like this, for the global financial crisis wow. to save jobs. Wow, so God has a plan and lead you as you follow I, Him. I believe, I believe God has a plan. Amen. You know, right. So flipping coin versus following God and thinking what He wants and you know, praying through, I think that's amazing. Right. Why don't you share with us more about you know, how do you came to know God? I think we would love to hear about your faith journey, something that maybe not many might sure. have heard personally. How okay. do you came to know Jesus and all these things? Yeah. All right. 
Um, I, will, I will title it MIC123. What is MIC? MIC123. So, you know, because we have COVID-19 and all these acronyms <laughs> and all that. So I thought that, you know, I should use some acronyms of MIC123. The first MIC is Man in Control. I came from a very humble family background. Uh, you know, we don't have much money growing up, so we work very hard. I still remember uh, in uh, 1978 when I, when I came to Singapore, what I had at that point in time is just a return ticket to Hong Kong and not more than a few hundred dollars in my pocket. I worked very hard, I saved money, I invested my money wisely, and, um, and, I, and my career was doing quite well in, in, in HP. So, at a very young age, at a very young age, um, I already up there, you know, uh, I remember when I returned from the U.S. after my expatriate assignment from the, from the U.S., I bought a pretty big plot of land with a house in the west coast of Singapore. I was not happy with the house. The house is not very old. I, I tear it all, I torn it all down, rebuilt it to my specification. I was already driving a European car. So I was living the Singaporean dream, you know. So I was, I was really happy. I was, uh, you know, career is doing well. I was in good health and so on and so forth. So I believe that all this uh, was because of me. I worked very hard for it. And therefore, this is something that I attributed to my effort uh, and, and, and my intelligence. And, and that is why I call this phase man in control. That's MIC1. Just as I thought that I have it made for the rest of my life, disaster hit. One day, my first wife called me from the office and said that she's not feeling well. And we were young and said that, why don't you go see a doctor and, um, and uh, take a look at you? She did. But weeks later, she still complained that, you know, she's still having this pain. So I say, in that case, you better go see a specialist. So she went to see a specialist. And when the result came back, when she called me with the result, we were both shocked because she was diagnosed with an advanced stage of liver cancer. I didn't panic because I have money. I have connections at that point in time because I know some of the best oncologists in Singapore. So I say that, don't worry, we will fight it and, and we will be fine. But when the oncologist told me that she don't have much longer to live, I couldn't believe it. I say there's no, no way, no way. So we went to Mexico for alternative medicine treatment but she didn't get better. And shortly after she came back to Singapore, she passed away and left me with our young son. So I was MIC2, man in crisis. I was man in crisis. I started to ask myself what happened. I started to ask whether there are a divine being in control. It is obviously something beyond my capability to even change or manage. It was a very difficult period of time because I have to manage, I would, uh, manage my work, balance between my work and to look after my son. Because I would get up very early in the morning, make sure that he has breakfast, go to school. Then I, I go to work. I work very hard during the day. I will, I will come home, make sure that he has his dinner, do his homework, tuck him to sleep. And, I go, and many nights, I will go back to office and work. And the cycle just continue, 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 continue. I'm starting to ask myself whether there's other meaning in life. What exactly is this life all about? Who gives us this life? Where we come from? Where are we going after we pass away? So I have many, many questions, and that led me to actually look into various religions, you know, um, including churches. And I think at that point in time, uh, somebody actually took me to, 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 to church. And I started to debate with the pastor. Why am I a sinner? You know, why should people die? Why should good people die? I mean, I think if you see me at that point in time, maybe you don't want me to, you're, I, I'm not welcome. Because after service, you know, I'll be standing there <laughs> debating with the pastor. You know, uh, why should we, why, why is money bad? You know, having money is not bad. You know, and all these kind of things. So, so I think some of the churches see me coming, most probably in the pastor's mind is that, here's this guy again. But through this, 
um, it prompted me to search a little bit further that am I really in control? Are we really in control of everything? Or there's somebody else up there that is in control of everything? So I want to go back to now the final phase. There was one Friday night. I was, I was tired, but I couldn't sleep. All these questions keep coming up, keep coming up. And very early in the morning, I'm supposed to take my son to his school for his ECA. And I know that ECA, you know, you have to wait. You have to wait uh, for a while. And uh, I, I need, at that, at that point in time, you know, uh, internet data, mobile data is not so readily available. So I reached out to something that I wanted to bring along, you know, to occupy myself. So I, I saw on, next to my bedside, there's a book that somebody gave me, a book. The, the title of the book is that when God doesn't make sense, obviously from some Christians, you know, when God doesn't make sense. Okay, fine. I mean, to me, that's a great title because, you know, God, you really doesn't make sense. If you exist, you know, why is it all these things happening? So I took the book and I went to the school and when sitting down underneath a tree and I was starting to read the book. But as I read the book, something speaking to me. For the first time in my life, I realized how wonderful I am that I am alive. And I realized that there is a divine being that he is in control of our life. I'm starting to see leaves that in different shades of green, I can see the butterfly flying in front of me. I can hear my son and his friends uh, playing and laughing and so on and so forth. And at that moment, I accepted that there is a God and he is in control. Wow. So that is my, my third phase which is man in Christ. And I want to end this is because, you know, do you want to know who gave me that book? You want to know? Who? My current wife. She's the one who bought me the book, brought me to church, uh, lived through those periods of time that I was searching, and here I am. So, wow. MIC, one, two, three. God use you. <laughs> it's so amazing to hear how eventually you lay down your cry and your self-sufficiency and turn to Jesus and make Him your Lord and Savior. So what are some, I would say, you know, closing thoughts that you might have maybe as we go through life and, you know, it's really unknown, so many unknowns, but what's something that over the decades of living you have grown to be certain about? Okay. So if I may have my last PowerPoint slides, um, where do you find your anchor? Where do you find your anchor? A very valuable lesson to me to learn is to trust God and to make him my anchor and my rock. Not only that he is all wise and he's all powerful, he's also consistent and he's faithful. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I know that he loves me. In a world that is full of so many uncertainty, I know that God is the only certain because he never changed. And I want to have a shout out to you today that for those of you who have yet to know this awesome God of ours and you have not accepted Jesus into your life, there are no better time than now to find out more. Thank you so much. Thank Come you. On, let's give Lucas another big hand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. To those of us who are watching online as well and who are watching in the various uh, locations and centres, I would really want to ask you to give me some more of your time. To, for me to just round things up and to give us some thoughts because we don't just want to be here to hear some good um, advice or practical um, pointers and just move on. But I hope for us to pause a little, to reflect a bit and to just think about ourselves and our lives in this last 10 to 15 minutes of our time. You know, I really love the, the stories and the practical advice that you've shared. You know, thank you so much, Lucas. You know, can you help me? Just give me, just give Lucas another big hand. Thank you so much for sharing with us. You know, none of us here, we, none of us like uncertainties. As human beings, most, if not all of us, want our lives to be filled with certainty and with peace, you know. We want good surprises. We, we never want the bad ones. We hope for the best. We want things to turn out the best possible way. But we all know that life is filled with uncertainties. And as how Lucas put it, change is 
constant. Change is constant. You never know whether our jobs will be there the next day. We never know whether our businesses and our investment will surely succeed. It will give us a good ROI, a good return investment in return. We never know how our kids will turn out eventually. We never know when will be maybe our time to be in NCID, to be patient 321. We never know when this disease will go away and when it will eventually or it might eventually kill many of us. Uncertainty can be a very difficult thing to bear. However, from the Bible and from many live examples around, I have seen and I know that uncertainties are God's opportunity to touch us, to reach us, and to show Himself to us. And I'm so thankful that, Lucas, you shared so vulnerably to us about your experience and your time during your crisis time. It's, it's so, so touching that. But when you look back at his story, you will see that how God beautifully turned this very uncertain time in his life into an opportunity that he can take a pause. He can reflect on things. He can think about some of life's hardest and greatest questions that maybe in the past, many of us, you never really consider these questions. And I'm sure that many, maybe in our midst here, there's some of you here, you have come into a relationship with Jesus during your most uncertain time in your life. Maybe some of you here, you are really going through a very challenging time. You are going through a lot of stress, anxiety, a lot of pressure, not knowing what's ahead of you, maybe in your family, with your children, maybe with your own health, maybe in your finance, and you're all worried. I mean, and maybe as we look at this whole COVID-19 thing, as you read through the news, you get a bit of anxiety as you read through the news that, wow, how things, how, when things are really going to end, the world that we live in is really so uncertain. You know, never can we imagine even soccer can take a standstill. And those of you who are Liverpool fans, God bless your soul because you are going through the most uncertain time in your entire fanfare life, you know. Pastor Daniel, we will keep you in prayer, you know. Things can, <laughs> things can really change, you know. It's so challenging. But on a more serious note, on a more serious note, maybe, maybe God is using this uncertain time in your life to cause you to ask certain questions about life, about yourself. What do you, what do I truly need in life? Where do I go after this life? What else can I hold on to that is the most certain? What is my anchor in my life? What is life really all about? Is it really just about pursuing material gains, seeing our kids grow up, traveling around the world and taking off our bucket list? Is there really more to life than this? Who is the ultimate giver and sustainer of life. And maybe some of us here, during this uncertain time, it is a great time for you to pause and to reflect and to think about some of these questions. You know, one of my favorite times of the of day is to put my son to bed because that's the time that I can have a great conversation with him, I can pray with him, and he doesn't run around and just do all sorts of nonsense, but he can sit down and have a good conversation with me. So sometimes during the night and that, that those times, he asked me some of the most intriguing and most interesting questions that I can hear in life. And he asked this recently, he asked me this question, where do we go after we die? Do we become like mummies? Because we were reading about ancient Egypt and what they do is that they wrap the people up in mummies. So he's asking me, do we become like mummies? You know, so kind of interesting question. There was once he asked me and that's, our, that's, that's him. And at the corner, there's a bright spot. That's not a street lamp, right? That's a moon, okay? <laughs> he asked me this question, why is the moon white? I mean, it's quite intriguing, right? I never thought of it. Like, why can't it be purple, rainbow, pink, you know? Why is it white? He was asking me that. And just very recent, he asked me this question that I was quite taken aback. He asked me, Papa, why do people pray to the wrong God? I was quite taken aback because I'm not sure really how to answer him. 
Like, there's a lot in that question that he's asking. And, you know, I was just stunned. You know, even like how a child wonder and ponder whether is there God in life? Maybe some of us, it is time for us to really think about that. You see, in times of uncertainty, we are well positioned to see, to see our own inability as human beings to control life. We will see that life is really beyond us to predict, to manage. And in times of uncertainty, and I find it so true, especially hearing from Lucas today, that it is a time that we can lay aside our pride, lay aside our contentment in life and begin to seek God and to think about God and to think about life, who He really is. And I'll tell you today, even those of us who are watching on screen, that the God of the Bible is the Creator God. The God of the Bible is the God who gives us life. He is the God that created the universe and everything in it. He is that big, powerful person out there. But not only is He that, He is also a personal God. God wants to know you. God wants you, or rather God wants you to know Him. He has already known you. God wants you to know who He is. He wants you to have a relationship with Him, to love Him and to do life with Him. And only God knows what life is truly all about. And today I want to tell you, God is reaching out to you. He's reaching out to you, to each and every one of you. He knows you more than anyone else on this earth. But what stands between you and Him today is this thing called sin. You know, many, many of us might understand sin to be something that's like doing wrong things or doing bad things. Things like cheating, lying, doing unloving things to someone, thinking lustful thoughts, pride. Most, all of us, in some time or another in our lives, we will have done some of this. But you see, sin is more than just what we do. Sin is that thinking that, and that believing that we can do life all by ourselves, apart from God. Sin is thinking that we can handle life on our own, that we don't need Him, we reject this relationship with Him, and we don't care about who God is. That is sin. At the heart of it, it's not about whether we do more evil, or we do more good, as long as we think that we can live life on our own, all by ourselves, we are good on our own, that is sin. You know, I experienced that before and I think Lucas was mentioning in his story that how he, he found contentment and in everything that he has and you know, why do I need him? Why, why am I sinful? And some of us think that way and that in particular is the heart of sin. And me too, I thought that way before. But I thought that I don't need this spiritual crutches because I'm a self-made man. I can just do my, I can just, whatever I want, I just work hard, I can achieve it. But God, in His love and mercy, has chosen to reach out to all of us. He has graciously offered to right this wrong and to pay for the penalty of our sins. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. The penalty of sin, the penalty of our sin is judgment, is eternal death. But, the Bible, the verse says here, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God sent His one and only Son, Jesus, to come to earth many years back to die for our sins, to pay for our sins. And He didn't just die, He resurrected, proving Himself to be God. And that's why now, when we believe in Jesus, when we trust in Jesus and what He has done for us, every one of us here, every one of you here can have a relationship with God. You can have this personal relationship with God. If you confess your sins and believe in Jesus, you can experience this new life in Him. In Romans 10 verse 9, the Bible says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And the God I know, and the God that I know is this person. It's a person that I know and I do life with. I can go to Him every day. He, it is not, Christianity is not just a religion 
well, I come to church, I believe and I have some faith in something that will give me certainty. No, what gives me certainty is not this idea that I have, but it's really this relationship with God that I have, that I know that He is there and He doesn't change. And today, this same God wants to give you life to the fullest in Jesus. He wants to let you know that He's reaching out to you and He has sent His one and only Son, Jesus, to die for you as a sign of His greatest love for every one of us. God is the only certainty that you and I can ever, ever have in this time of uncertainty. He is truly the anchor of all our lives. There are some of you here, there are many of you here in fact, that are watching of us on screen. You do not have this personal relationship with Jesus. You do not know who Jesus is. You do not, you have thought about Him, you have been to church, you have considered Christianity, but you have never ever received Him into your life. Maybe today might be the day that you make that decision because uncertainties is the best time that you are well positioned to consider some of these things and to let God come into your life to touch you and to reach out to you. Some of all of us as believers right here in our life groups and in our centres, as we navigate through these very uncertain times, I want you to know that we have the greatest news on earth and that that is that Jesus is alive. He didn't just die, but He resurrected. And because of that, we can have confidence. We need not fear in this life because no matter what life can throw at us, we know that Jesus is our hope. He has overcome everything. He has overcome the greatest thing on earth, that is death. And that's why we can live life with hope in Him with the power that He gives us. And we have confidence that no matter what can, that might happen around us in the world, He can turn everything for His good, in His purpose, in His timing, because He is a sovereign God. And that's a God that we worship. And that's a God that we love. Can I just invite everyone who is in Exodus, everyone who is watching us in our centres, to just rise on your feet.